into Him. Conversion is to become more and more fully true, true branches on the true vine. And this we know from experience is a life, lifelong process. Tertullian rightly affirmed that one becomes a Christian. One is not born one. We become more and more Christians. Most of us may have been baptized as little children. I was baptized the day after I was born. <laughs> that was customary. Now we see more and more adults and young people being baptized. But even though we received the gift of faith, hope, and charity, we were incorporated in, into the Trinity, into the God's church as babies, it takes all our lives to become true Christians and to learn to walk the talk and to live and witness as his disciples. I like the image of yeast. Yeast is a fascinating thing. It is so small in size and yet such a powerful effect on the dough. The yeast works slowly and somewhat miraculously. <coughs> little by little the dough rises and is transformed. This is always something fascinating to watch. I remember my grandmother made bread. They didn't buy bread. We lived on a, on a small farm and my grandparents were the second neighbors and they, uh, my grandma made bread uh, once or twice a week and to see the loaves of bread there and to see them rise and rise. This is the ideal way for the gospel to work in our lives. Right now, the kingdom of God is first and foremost alive in our hearts. The conversion of our hearts will rarely effectively take place in a day or in a moment. Sure, each day and every moment is important. And there are certainly powerful moments of conversion we can all point to in our lives. But conversion of heart is more like yeast causing the dough to rise. The conversion of heart is usually something that takes place little by little and step by step. We allow the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives in a continually deepening way. And as we do, we grow deeper and deeper in holiness, in profound relationship with Jesus. Just as dough rises slowly but surely. Can you remember a special moment in your life when you had a personal experience and encounter with Jesus? What did it change in your life? A lot of people who witness of having an encounter, sometimes it's through a cursillo, it's through a, a friend's witnessing, an experience, uh, through sickness and many, many ways people encounter the Lord hearing, uh, not hearing a Cardinal's conference, that's for sure, but <laughs> reading the Word of God or a moment of prayer. Most people say that is like being born anew. There's before and then there's after. When I discovered the love of God for me, when I had that personal encounter with Jesus Christ, it changed my life forever. What did it change in your life? I'd like to share a personal story if you allow, allow me to do that. I remember when I was 10 years old, my parents had experienced such an encounter with the Lord, our Savior. They went on a retreat for a weekend of evangelization. Lay people and priests preached and witnessed about how Jesus was at the heart of their lives and how he had changed them for the better. I'm the oldest of seven. Uh, we're already five at that time. And uh, uh, we were babysat by my grandmother while my parents went on. And when they came back home on Sunday afternoon, I could see they were transformed. They were just not the same. 
they were holding hands. I had never seen my parents hold hands before. <laughs> you know, in those days, this was 1967, the, the cars, the front seat was a full seat. It wasn't like now we have a console. <laughs> where you could put your coffee and your phone and everything. And we, we'd go out places and mom would sit right next to dad. Usually it was one of us kids between them. <laughs> now she was the one sitting there. Why, why this change? What, what happened on this retreat? And from the day they came back home, they came home, they had received as a gift, every participant in that weekend, a New Testament. And they began participating in a weekly gospel sharing group with other couples. There were eight or ten people in homes. One week it was at our house, another week was someone else's house, they'd go around. Every night, every, every week, one night, they'd come back. My dad would come back and, my, and from work. We'd have dinner. They'd wash and change. And then they'd go off to this meeting. Or sometimes when it was at our house, being the oldest, I was 10, sometimes I could stay up a little bit for the beginning of the meeting and see them <laughs> sing with other people and welcome each other. Wow, what's happening to my parents? <laughs> they were so different with us also. Here's a photo of my parents. My mom is the one in the, in the, uh, the black dress. My dad is on the right there with the, uh, with the checkered. Uh, she was expecting my sister, Sylvie, the sixth. Uh, and there they are with their little group sharing the gospel. That progressively changed them and changed the life of our family because they met in a personal way the Lord. Now, we were a Catholic family. We'd go to Mass every Sunday. We did all our sacraments. Everything was in order. But my dad said after this, many years after, when he explained, and I've heard him talk about this, he said, we did our religion in a very good way. We respected all the laws and everything. But now, Jesus became someone. We just didn't do it to do it like we had to. It was a joy to feed on the Word of God, to share it. And once we've shared the Word of God in our little group during the week, we go to church on Sunday. How interesting it was to see, well, how's the priest going to talk about this gospel? We shared on it. I've seen them grow and grow and grow. Well, this year, my parents are celebrating their 62nd wedding anniversary. And you know, after 51 years, they continue every week to share the gospel in a small group. Someone said to, uh, to my dad once, after quite a few years, he says, oh, you still going to those groups? Those Bible groups? He says, yeah. It must get boring. It's always the same gospels that come back, you know? <laughs> Sunday readings every three years, it's the same thing. Oh, he says, oh, no, not at all. The gospel's always the same, but I'm always different. <laughs> I'm always different. He says, it's always new. It touches me. We discover. You know, and, and sometimes they'll come visit me, and they live six hours away. And uh, they'll come visit me, and uh, my dad says to my mom, Bridget, tomorrow we got to leave. we got a meeting tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> oh, come on, Dad. You can miss a meeting. No, we don't. <laughs> They try, they still enjoy it. The encounter with Jesus changed their life and our life too. And you know, they never tried to push us to, to do this and obliged us, no. But watching them live and, and grow in their faith, in their relationship with the Lord, and how it opened them up to a new way of living with us and living with others, our house became an open family. And my parents were doing things with a lot of other people. It invited us. What is there in this Jesus that is so admirable? I want that. And I can say that from all those years, 10, 11, 12 years old, seeing the impact of the encounter with Jesus and the Word of God in their lives gave me, invited me, Put in my heart this desire. That's what I want to do when I get older. Bring people to meet Jesus. 
it does wonders. He is truly an awesome person. And you know, my parents never became fanatics. And you could think, wow, 51 years sharing the gospel, they must be, <laughs> No, they're not fanatics. My dad was a lumberjack and a farmer in his early years, had very little schooling. He barely knew how to read and write, but his heart was truly touched by the Lord, and that gave him the boost to continue on his journey. You know, when the heart is touched, when you have experienced the love of God in a personal way, things in life find their correct place. I share this story because I saw the difference in our family as a 10-year-old boy, and it was powerful enough to touch my heart and bring me to trust in Jesus and believe in His loving presence. That is why this morning I'm insisting so much in this first talk. The foundation of missionary life is your encounter in your life with Jesus Christ as a disciple. Pope Francis on Ash Wednesday this year had some very valuable advice. The season of Lent is a favorable time to remedy the dis dissonant chords of our Christian life and to receive the ever new joyful and hopeful <coughs> proclamation of the Lord's Passover. The church in her maternal wisdom invites us to pay special attention to anything that could dampen or even corrode our believing heart. The Pope Francis says, we are subject to numerous temptations. Each of us knows the difficulties we have to face. And it is sad to know that when faced with ever varying circumstances of our daily lives, there are voices raised that take advantage of pain and uncertainty. The only thing they aim to do is sow distrust. If the fruit of faith is charity, as Mother Teresa often used to say, the fruit of distrust is apathy and resignation. Distrust, apathy, and resignation, these are demons that deaden and paralyze the soul of a believing people. Lent is the ideal time to unmask these and other temptations to allow our hearts to beat once more and to beat once more in tune with the vibrant heart of Jesus. The whole of the Lenten season is imbued with this conviction, which we could say is echoed by three words offered to us in order to rekindle the heart of the believer. Pope Francis says these three words, and I will reflect on them with you this morning, are pause, <coughs> see, and return. Pause, see, and return. Pause a little, he says. Leave behind the unrest and commotion that fill the soul with bitter feelings which never get us anywhere. Pause a little for this compulsion to a fast-paced life that scatters, divides, and ultimately destroys time with family, with friends, with children, with grandparents, and time as a gift, time with God. Pause for a little while, says the Pope. Refrain from the, the need to show off and be seen by all, to continually appear on the notice board that makes us forget the value of intimacy and recollection. Pause for a little while. Refrain from haughty looks, from fleeting and pejorative comments that arise from forgetting tenderness, compassion, and reverence for the encounter with others, particularly those who are vulnerable, hurt, and even immersed in sin and error. Pause for a little while. Refrain from the urge to want to control everything, know everything, destroy everything. This comes from overlooking gratitude for the gift of life and all the good we receive. Pause for a little while. 
refrain from the deafening noise that weakens and confuses our hearing, that makes us forget the fruitful and creative power of silence. Pause for a little while. Refrain from the attitude which promotes sterile and unproductive thoughts that arise from isolation and self-pity and that cause us to forget going to encounter others to share their burdens and suffering. Pause for a little while. Refrain from the emptiness of everything that is instantaneous, momentary and fleeting, that deprives us of our roots, our ties, of the value of continuity and the awareness of our own ongoing journey. Pause a little while in order to look and contemplate. I don't know if we're going to have enough for 40 days to accomplish this. Pause. Then he says, see. See the gestures that prevent the extinguishing of charity, that keep the flame of faith and hope alive. Look at faces alive with God's tenderness and goodness working in our midst. See the face of our families who continue striving day by day with great effort in order to move forward in life and who despite many concerns and much hardship are committed to making their homes a school of love. See the faces of our children and young people filled with yearning for the future and hope, filled with tomorrows and opportunities that demand dedication and protection. Living shoots of love and life that always open up a path in the midst of our selfish and meager calculations. See our elderly, whose faces are marked by the passage of time, faces that reveal the living memory of our people, faces that reflect God's wisdom at work. See the faces of our sick people and the many who take care of them. Faces which in their vulnera vulnerability and service remind us that the value of each person can never be reduced to a question of calculation or utility. See also the remorseful faces of so many who try to repair their errors and mistakes and who from their misfortune and suffering fight to transform their situations and move forward. See and contemplate the face of crucified love who today from the cross continues to bring us hope. His hand held out to those who feel crucified, who experience in their lives the burden of failure, disappointment, and heartbreak. See and contemplate the real face of Christ, crucified out of love for everyone, without exception. For everyone? Yes, for everyone. To see his face is an invitation filled with hope for this Lenten time. In order to defeat the demons of distrust, apathy, and resignation, the face that invites us to cry out, the kingdom of God is possible. Pause a little. See and return. Return to the house of your Father. Return without fear to those outstretched, eager arms of your Father who is rich in mercy, who awaits you. Return without fear, for this is the favorable time to come home, to the home of my Father and your Father. It is the time for allowing one's heart to be touched. Persisting on the path of evil gives rise to disappointment and sadness. True life is something quite distinct, and our heart indeed knows this. God does not tire, nor will he tire, of holding out his hand. Return without fear to join in the celebration 
of those who are forgiven.